Hello everyone, I'm here today to talk about the Read platform technology. It's a handheld point of care technology for rapidly assessing a patient's response to sepsis towards enhancing sepsis outcomes through clinical evidence-based management. And how do we go about doing this? This is an extremely complex idea and I'm going to unpack this for you. And in order to do that, I have to take you back to the very beginning. This is back in 2005, where I was a young assistant professor trying to set up my own research lab in Portland, Oregon. And I was trying to find problems that could transform the way the human experience went and to enhance the quality of care for life. I kept thinking about this consistently and as I was a sensor designer, thought about problems where my sensor design would change the way human life interacted with technology. I found a group of clinicians and they were very much interested in looking at designing a blood test that could help them screen for patients who come to them with arteriosclerosis prior to surgery to figure out if the patient had vulnerable cardiovascular plaque or whether it was stable arteriosclerotic plaque. What exactly am I talking about? Our arteries are the major blood vessels that carry oxygen-rich blood from our heart to the rest of the body. And like plumbing or water pipes, they get sometimes clogged, they get coated with material which is basically made of lipids, cholesterol, proteins, which basically clog those pipes. So the way to treat it through surgery is basically what's known as an angioplasty, or you have a stent, so to clean up those pipes. But before the surgery, you want to know if, you're a, if you are the physician, whether that arterial wall is going to remain stable post-surgery, or it's going to collapse or deform. And this depended on the type of plaque that formed. So if it was stable plaque, then the wall would stay the way it was. The patient would have a good surgery and nothing would happen, which was adverse. But if that plaque was unstable, then that wall would collapse and the patient would die and have an adverse outcome. So clearly, figuring out the proteins that would help us do this blood test very quickly before the patient went into surgery would help with the outcome. So we spent about three years trying to figure out what proteins to look for, and we tried quite a few things. We never could find the exact ones which work like the indicators on our automobiles that tell us to turn left or right. Similarly, we could never find the proteins here that told us, okay, if you measure these and these are elevated, then you have vulnerable plaque versus stable plaque. So we had to abandon that problem after three years with a bunch of publications, but no technology to boast about. So now fast forward to 2008. And here I am now in Phoenix, Arizona. I'd met a bioengineer and he had developed these single chain fragments, which are again, proteins, engineered proteins. And we were trying to look to distinguish between three different types of proteins that could be there in our brain to distinguish between Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and dementia with the Lewy body. So now, again, mostly these proteins would be prevalent within the brain, and then it would seep down through the cerebrospinal fluid, which goes around the brain and the spinal cord, and you'd be trying to look for them. So we thought we engineered a very sensitive test that could look at one part of the Y that you see there, binding to the proteins and different proteins on the same sensor. Now the problem is the following. Getting access to the cerebrospinal fluid is tough. So getting access is going to require you to do a spinal tap for a patient. No one likes that. It's very <laughs> difficult to do and it's painful. It can have adverse outcomes to the patient. So clearly that's not going to work. The second thing is we couldn't access this in healthy or in human subjects. We could only get them in post-mortem, so dead people. So no point building a test on dead, for dead people. So you have to do it for people who are alive where you can change their life. So two lessons learned, first from the st study in Portland and here in Arizona. You have to find the right protein or the right biomarker to go after. 
Second, you have to build an ultra sensitive test on fluids or body fluids that are easily accessible like your blood through a finger prick. So with both these ideas in mind, I decided to go for the next generation of the sensor technology to address this. But before I could do any of that, my professional and personal life hit a major roadblock. And the year was 2010 and the month was April. I was a new mom and I was trying to just get used to the fact that I had a young baby to take care of, figure out breastfeeding and all the rest. And my application to permanent residency to the United States got denied. So here I was in an academic job and I didn't have a legal petition at this point. So I had to renew or redo the legal petition. At the same time, figure out how to stay legally in the United States. And the only way I could do that was to find myself another academic job. So a quick primer on how academic jobs work in the tenure track here in the United States. So all the various job postings come up in the fall semester of a school year. All the applicants get interviewed and then, of course, the decisions are made and the job offer is given to you pretty much early spring. So by May, uh, every job is taken and most likely the decisions are made in March and April of the year. So in April, if I'm going to look for an academic job, the chances of me finding them are pretty slim. But there were two job openings that was matching to my background, my expertise, and I applied to them. One was in Wichita, Kansas, and the other was here in UT Dallas. I interviewed in both places. The job in Dallas, they told me they didn't have the research funding to help me start up my research lab here. So they couldn't make me a job offer that year. So they had to decline. And then the only job for which I'm very grateful to is the one that I got in Wichita, Kansas. So the interesting here th is that between Phoenix and Wichita, there was no direct flight at that point of time. So I had to fly Phoenix, Denver, Denver, Wichita, or Phoenix, Houston, Houston, Wichita, back and forth. For a family, we felt the best thing would be that I would commute, leave baby, dad, and everybody else back in Phoenix, and we'd keep doing this till we figured out what would happen next. You know, there were too many variables at that point to process. So when I was doing this, I was carrying my breast pump, all the milk that the babe, the breast milk that you can see out there, up and down on these planes. I started observing a very curious phenomenon. That milk that you see there in those bags. So when the, I came back home to Phoenix after the flight uh, or the two long plane rides, I'd see that very clear structures, kind of like the pictures that you see out there in green. So where the proteins, the fat, all separated out. And these designs and shapes look like how snowflakes look. And it happened consistently. Then when I reconstituted the milk and fed it to my son, he didn't complain and he seemed fine, didn't get sick. So this was a very curious phenomenon. If I could now replicate a sensor surface that could do that, where I could separate out those proteins in a very clear manner, at the same time not mess up the body fluid in which they were, which was what I was going after was blood, remember? So if, if I could do that consistently, then maybe I could build that revolutionary blood test that I was interested in from the very beginning. So I found and partnered with a material scientist and he helped me think through this problem and he designed a material system that which, which we call the designer material, kind of like a designer sorry, and which could do the same thing on proteins. And then I figured out how to reconstitute that material into a sensor platform, and we had now a sensor. Now that was how in 2014, N-License was formed, and we founded this company towards the idea for enabling life science technologies. And now we have built this really efficient mouse trap. We're feeling very proud of ourselves. What is the mouse we were going to go and catch? So in my experience, having worked with cardiologists before, I knew that there was this big problem which existed, which was this idea about quickly triaging patients who had myocardial infarction or heart attacks. 
So very often in emergency departments around the country and around the world, you see people coming in with chest pains and other symptoms, and sometimes with no symptoms at all. How do you figure out that that particular patient is having a myocardial infarction is very challenging. So if we could do a single finger prick blood test and rapidly screen out these people, then we could actually process clinical care faster, evidence-based clinical management. So we talked to a bunch of physicians, clinicians in the emergency room departments around the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and we wrote up this non-dilutive equity proposal to the Small Business Innovation Research Network funded by the National Institute of Health, and we thought that this idea had merit. Imagine to our surprise, nobody liked it. They kept turning us down. We kept wondering why. Here it is, we built the sensing test, which can be thousand times more sensitive than what's commercially available. Why don't we have any takers? So the reason is this. There are two competing major players in the market. While the test may be thousand times less sensitive, the regulatory outcome, the, uh, the amount of resources that has to be invested to make this clinically viable was so significant that everybody thought that the risk outweighed the reward. And they didn't think that this idea had any commercial merit, not technical merit, but commercial merit. So this was a lesson to us. This is not a problem for which we could put out a commercially viable product. So we were back to the drawing board. What do we do next? In talking to the same emergency departments as well as to critical care physicians, we became quickly aware of this one major problem that's there in all hospitals all around the world. One in three hospital deaths happen due to sepsis. Today, more likely in many of the states, it's one in two hospital deaths happen because of sepsis. So what is sepsis? Sepsis is the body's unusually severe response to infection. Now, infection can have two triggers. It can be bacterial in nature, it can be viral, and sometimes it can also be fungal in nature. So if the bug that's attacking the human, who's the host, is bacterial or viral or fungal, it will trigger a very, an inflammatory response within the body. And what that does is tells the body to release a bunch of chemicals that's going to enhance the inflammation, which is known as the pro-inflammatory response, the little spike you see on the top. And the body's putting out all these messenger molecules. The problem is sometimes when the body gets into this hyper-inflamed state, it gives the body the wrong clue to attack its own organs and start shutting them down. So this is like a train wreck happening in slow motion. And you can't stop it. So generally, for the person to recover, a pro-inflammatory response, a hyperinflamed response, has to be modulated with the downward trajectory, which is going to be the complementary anti-inflammatory response, or the compensatory anti-inflammatory response. Generally, things don't work so much in sync. Sometimes, people who have no underlying health conditions can have such a severe hyperinflamed response that everything shuts down and you don't know why you can't get them to recover. And sometimes people with relatively compromised immune systems might recover. This is even more critical today because the COVID-19 pandemic has done this. You see, of the over 500 million people who died in the hospitals today, they're having this messenger molecule, which is known as a cytokine response, Tom, that's driving these deaths. So now, if you could match or figure out as this is happening every three hours, what's happening to that patient, you can modulate the care that you're giving to the patient. Because most likely, the way sepsis is dealt with is you give a broad spectrum antibiotic and you give an anti-inflammatory. But it does matter when you give it and how you give it for the body to recover. Because, and it's different for different people. And if you don't do this, then the outcomes are not going to be good and you're never going to know why one person recovers and the other doesn't. So now this particular blood test that we are building has the ability to be designed in this manner that you do a simple finger prick in that you're looking for that pro-inflammatory hyper response and the anti-inflammatory response in conjunction to figuring out whether it is a bacterial trigger or a viral trigger that's causing this response. 
Now, if you're able to do this every three hours to the patient, you can modulate the care in real time for that patient. And again, this problem is not just a problem in North America. It's true as a global problem. So we partnered with ACASO, which was a group with the Henry Jackson Foundation of Military Medicine. And what we did was we looked at patients from across the globe, from North America, from Africa, and from Asia. And we looked at their responses. And we demonstrated that this platform technology that we built could map out or map the sepsis endotyping out, which is the ability to figure out how a person is responding and to enhance sepsis outcomes. So now here we have this wonderful little platform that can sit on the palm of our hands and that little cartridge which tests every single time for this combination of these proteins and tells you how the body is doing, the host or the human is doing, and your individualized response to your therapy with the intention and the hope that we can recover more people and not one in two or one in three deaths in the hospital is going to be because of sepsis. This can also then be transported outside a hospital into areas which are highly austere, you know, such as in rural areas, in remote settings, where uh, the country is at war, all of this towards assessing and treating people in real time. So this technology now is ready for prime time. It requires funding. It requires randomized clinical trials. It requires the regulatory approval. And we're working towards achieving all of this. So I hope to come back another time to tell you the story of the impact of the read platform technology on human life. And I thank you for your attention.